Don't believe the Financial Times. Don't believe the Bank of England. Don't believe the BBC. No, I correct that. Never believe the BBC. This guest is by far the most influential politician in the UK. Can you give us a bit of a scoop on the next move for Nigel Farage? I'm beginning to think maybe a really big historic opportunity is opening up. If you're wokey, left or socialist, you are going to hate this interview. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. cards on the table, yeah. real reason why you did I'm a Celebrity. They first asked me in 2016. They've asked me every year since. And every year I've said no. However, if you believe in liberty, entrepreneurship, free markets, democracy, you will love this interview with Nigel Farage. So Nigel, um, I think last time we met, you'd recently been debanked. Yes. And I think things have probably changed for you since then. Yeah, but debanking thing, you know, I'd heard stories about people being debanked. You know, there were rumours about companies that were being debanked. You'd see sort of mail on Sunday, financial columns, small businesses losing bank accounts. So I knew there was a problem, but I had no idea how big the problem was. And then I've been with uh, NatWest Coots for 43 years. All my personal um, accounts, my business accounts, when I had a brokerage firm in the city and since. Um, I was no trouble to them at all. You know, positive cash balance, in fact, in terms of money management, much bigger than it probably should have been. Um, never defaulted on mortgages, loans, or anything. And out of the blue, I get a phone call followed by a letter saying, you've got two months to close your accounts. And I was pretty horrified by this, but I thought it'll be okay because I'll find somewhere else I can go. I was refused by 10 other high street banks. Would not take my business. And that is because the corporate world in Britain has been completely infested with uber liberal, left wing, diversity, inclusion, cobblers. Absolute cobblers. And they feel it's okay to discriminate against you on the basis of your views. Now, luckily, luckily for me, there is a procedure out there called a subject access request. Are you all familiar? Well, you see, most people aren't. Most people aren't. Well, I think I probably help make people aware of what they are. So you are entitled to go to any institution and ask for the personal information that they hold on you and as a part of law, under the Freedom of Information Act, they have to give you that data. So I went for my, I went for my subject access request from Coots, uh, which they delivered to me, and it was appalling. They mentioned Russia 144 times. You know, was I being funded by the Kremlin? Well, I've never taken a penny of Russian money in my life. Brexit, of course, was named 90 times because they're opposed to that. The fact that I'm a, a, a skeptic on government net zero policies, that was another big cross against my name. But what they also published were the personal notes. Things like, I wish we could push him out of a moving car. I mean, really nasty, unpleasant stuff. And then at the bottom of the margins, they were evaluating, will he go public? No, he won't go public because it'll be too embarrassing for him to admit that he's been debanked. Well, you know what? <laughs> they picked on the wrong bloke, <laughs> didn't they? And as soon as I, it, it's rather like coming out. As, as, soon as, I, as soon as I came out <laughs> as, as being debanked, suddenly, all through the political world, other people started putting their hands up, saying they also had been debanked. Nearly all of them, people of a conservative disposition, not those of a leftist disposition. And I was just, I've never been, Rob, I've never been as inundated on my website with emails as on this subject. What I began to realize was the people suffering the worst from this are limited companies in this country. And even last year, 140,000 UK limited companies were debanked. Now, maybe a couple of thousand of them were crooks. Maybe some of them were, you know, 
laundering money for drug gangs or whatever it was. But the vast majority would have been decent, ordinary businesses. They're being debanked for a variety of reasons. One is if they take too much cash. You know, if I'm running a fish stall, I'm taking tenors from people. But where do I put that money? Because the local bank has probably closed, the branch. And now NatWest and Barclays are saying they won't take more than 20,000 quid a year. So one reason for debanking is they don't want anybody that deals in cash. The other real reason is unusual payments. You know, you have a big transaction. This immediately means that, you know, you, you could be a front for a Colombian cocaine gang. Um, and it's cheaper <laughs> for the bank. Well, no, but I'm being serious. I know. You know, under but money. it's a fucking joke. <laughs> well, it is. So I've really pushed and kicked hard on this. 50% of the emails I got said, Dear Mr. Farage, I don't normally agree with you, but... <laughs> <laughs> which, given it was 52.48, I guess kind of <laughs> makes sense. Um, I've managed to push the government into promising they will pass legislation before the next election to effectively make it illegal to debank people on the basis of their legally held opinions. So on the face of it, it's a massive win. But in reality... Are they going to do it? Are they actually going to do it? And how long is Rishi actually going to survive in number 10 anyway? And, you know, businesses involved in, take, you know, shotgun trade, for example. Very, very difficult now if you're involved with the shotgun business. Even running a clay shoot, you'll find it very, very difficult to get a bank account or to keep a bank account. So it isn't just me being a high profile political figure. It's being applied right across business. Um, you know, if you work in oil and gas exploration, very difficult to get a bank account because these things are not approved. So look, it was a, it, it, it's been a fight, Rob, that I was pleased to take on, a fight that on the face of it, I'm winning some big victories with promises from government and regulators. But I tell you what, I'm not holding my breath on any of this. And I am. I'm deeply fearful, and we discussed this over a cup of tea a minute ago, I'm deeply fearful that government would like to drive cash out of our lives. And remember, from 2030, they are going to introduce, and it'll be a test form to begin with, but from 2030, under Jeremy Hunt's plans, there will be a central bank digital currency. If they can control your bank account, if they can control your freedom, you might as well be living under communism. So all of us, in every way, must do our utmost to fight against this monstrosity. And uh, one thing I do do, this is a bit naughty, I shouldn't really say this, but if you go into a coffee shop, and there's a sign that says, cash not accepted. So what I now do is order a latte, put a tenner down, so I'm sorry, and, and, then, and then just walk out. <laughs> but then, I'm always looking for a fight, aren't I? <laughs> But no, and I think, I think we should actually, in our daily lives, just think about maybe using cash a little bit more. Otherwise, it's going to go. So, Nigel, one more question on the debanking and cashless society. Who's behind all of this? The removal of cash and the control of politically exposed people? Well, yeah, I mean, the whole, the, the whole politically exposed person thing is nonsense, because it doesn't just apply to the political figure, it applies to their family. And I could give you a long list of my family members that have been debanked, I'm not going to do that. But, I mean, you know, the thought that somebody, just because they're related to me, has a business account closed, frankly, is monstrous. Through the International Monetary Fund, the OECD, the Bank of England, the European Union, the United Nations. This is globalism, folks. Globalism is about unelected bodies taking ever more power, which diminishes the power of the nation state and therefore diminishes our ability to hire and fire those that are making our laws. Who benefits? The bigger the business, the more they benefit. And if I've learned anything, you know, bear in mind, I was elected to the European Parliament back in the 1990s, so I've kind of been around a bit. And if I've learned anything 
through my years in politics, it is that big business has such a hold over government that government policy and government behavior, they are increasingly in hock to big global corporate companies. And my fight for Brexit, whether you agree with Brexit or not, if you think about it, the whole point of Brexit was to fight against these monstrous, undemocratic, dominated by big companies, artificial states that are being created. And Brexit, I think, was the first brick out of the wall. And, I think, and, and the fight back's coming. The fight back's coming all across Europe. The fight back is coming. And in America, the fight back, well, there's only one man that can lead the fight back <laughs> in America. <laughs> oh. Uh. <laughs> Such a great guy, great, amazing guy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What can we do about this, Nigel? What can we do against the globalist movement? Well, I mean, what I would say is don't support politically those that, it, those that have always endorsed it and will make it worse and worse. That is, that, 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 that is an individual power that we have, um, and, and, and that's very important. I mentioned the cash point earlier, that we can use cash a bit more to sort of say to the banks that we need this. We can't function without it. Uh, we can protect ourselves, though. You know, any of you out there that have got one business bank account that think everything's great and I'm never going to face a problem, well, look what happened to me. If they can debank me, they can debank you. All right? For whatever spurious reason. Could even be somebody you were at school with does something wrong. And honestly, this is how bad all this stuff is. So protect yourselves. Make sure that you've got access to other bank accounts, even though it's an absolute pain in the ass opening bank accounts, make sure you've got more than one bank account. That's the first basic protection. Anybody, both at a business and at a personal level, really, really ought to do. In fact, I'd go as far as to say have three. So protect yourself with that. <coughs> In terms of the future, uh, well, I think you should consider having some assets that can't be taken from you. At one of those assets is, yeah, well, you know, one of those assets, of course, is a gold coin. Something that you actually physically own, you know. And the other is, maybe this is a bit technical, I don't know, but, you know, cryptocurrencies, yes, they've had their problems. Yes, there are some very unreliable providers. You know, Mr. Bankman Freud, God help us. Friend of Tony Blair and Bill Clinton's, they all just about deserve each other, I suppose, in many ways. And there are risks, but actually, one of the reasons that crypto is growing as quickly as it is, particularly in America, is this is the ultimate, if you think about it, it's the ultimate individual sovereignty. You are in charge of your money. The tax man can't take it. The bank can't close you down. And so I still believe that, and yes, there are some things to be sorted out within the industry, but I still believe that having something in the way of money in cryptocurrencies, again, is a very, very good protection. Do you remember those Canadian truckers? Mm. So these were guys, some girls too, you know, driving long distance lorries, and suddenly Trudeau, the boss of Canada, put a vaccine mandate on people who never meet anybody else ever anyway. And they were set to lose their livelihoods until they were jabbed sort of every fortnight or whatever the recommendation was. Um, and they protested. And what happened? Their bank accounts were all frozen. All frozen. And the only way, Rob, they were fed and watered during that protest was through cryptocurrency. Wow. So I hope that's a constructive, and if, you know, and if you're not on that road yet, don't be embarrassed by it. Most people aren't on that road yet. Most people don't quite get why this is so significant. But I know from my visits to America that in Miami, you can now buy everything from a Ferrari to a cup of coffee using Bitcoin or Ethereum. Don't think this is going to go away. Don't believe the Financial Times. Don't believe the Bank of England. Don't believe the BBC. No, I correct that. Never believe the BBC. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
because they will all tell you that sure. cryptocurrencies are valueless and a flash in the pan. They're not. And it's something all of you, if you haven't done it yet, just start looking into, reading into, and thinking about. Do you agree with that? What do you guys think? <laughs> We've been talking about this for two and a half days. Fine. I 100% okay. agree with that. Good. Okay, now let's move. Nigel, yeah. honestly, yeah. cards on the table, yeah. real reason why you did I'm a Celebrity. Oh, <laughs> well. So they first asked me in 2016 to go on I'm a Celebrity. And I thought, no, it's humiliating. Um, it's for people on the way down in their careers, not on the way up. And you kind of think about it, it's normally sort of slightly has been -y types that go on to the programme. They've asked me every year since. And every year I've said no. And actually, for me, uh, 2023 was a really good year. Uh, firstly, the debanking thing put me, I think, 38 front pages in the space of two weeks. Some great cartoons as well, a few of which I <laughs> bought. I love cartoons of myself, I really do. <laughs> The lovely one, bank robber going into Coots with a gun. He said, the only, the only reason I chose this bank is I knew Farage wouldn't be in here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and some lovely stuff. And then, of course, I had the, the, um, my, my, my recent career with GB News, because I won the Trick Award, the Television and Radio Industry Award last year, as News Presenter of the Year, which was just such fun. And when I went to collect the award, voted for by the public, not the industry, there was booing in the room from the established industry. And so I took to the stage and thought, you know what? I'm going to really spoil your evening. <laughs> and I did. So it was, 23 was a good year for me, Rob. And I thought, actually, do you know what? I've got some positive things going on. The divisiveness of Brexit is kind of easing. There's a young audience out there that loved this programme who were like 12 when the referendum happened, who don't know who I am. So number one, reach a young audience. Number two, a lot of those people that don't like me don't like me because of what was said in the Brexit debate, but haven't got a clue who I really am as a person. So that, well, let them see who I am. If they want to hate me, that's fine, but they can hate me with good reason or like me. And the third reason was I noticed a hint of desperation in their voices. They clearly didn't have many very well-known people going into the jungle. It was the first time for three years they'd been back to Australia because of COVID and everything else, and they really, really, really wanted me. They really wanted me. And so I thought, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll just ask for a ridiculous number. <laughs> I fucking love this. <laughs> we'll just ask for a number that is ludicrous, a number the likes of which they've never, pay, never even contemplated paying anybody. But, you know, there's like two weeks to go. You know, they're in trouble. They, they need me more than I need them. So I asked for a ridiculous number. They said, that's ridiculous. To which I said, go away and have a think about it. <clears throat> they then came back and said, look, please, can you make another offer? We're going to offer you X. You know, come back with a counter offer. Uh, we need to know by midday tomorrow. And so I'm sitting there, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> Quarter past 11. Am I going to be reasonable? Or wholly unreasonable? <laughs> and I thought, they're in trouble. They think I'm going to blink. I'm bloody well not. <laughs> so... First reason for doing it, reaching our audience. Second reason for doing it is to hopefully take away some of the negatives that people felt about me during a divisive national campaign. The third reason was it was a bloody great big paycheck. They paid up, so there we are. <laughs> <laughs> and can I say, I, I will say this, that programme is genuine. You know, what you see is what you get. There are no, you know, no one's coming in with, with pints of beer and pizza. You know, that is it. You are in that camp. You've just got to get on with it. It's actually physically very, very tough. You know, you know I, was, I mean, I was, I was double the age of most people in that camp. And the sheer physicality of, you know, carrying water and wood, doing all that stuff, sleeping on really uncomfortable beds. I mean, 24 days I was in there. Um, 
And you know what? I'd do it again. I'd do it again. I loved it. You know, as a teenager, I was in army cadets, I was in scouts. You know, I'm an outdoorsy person anyway. But you know, what an extraordinary thing. For over three weeks, not to speak to anybody from the outside world, other than that group of people that you're with. You literally live for the day. You live for the moment. You live for planning the next meal. Is there enough water that's been boiled and clean? So, so you, you, know, you are literally living like people lived thousands of years ago. You've got no choice but to get on with the people you're with, even if at times, with that Frenchman, Fred, it wasn't that easy. And you have no contact with the outside world at all. You know, I mean, you know, I've lived on these things since the late 1980s. So to have no access, no sugar, no coffee, which, pe which people miss badly, no tea, no news, no booze, <laughs> which was a bit wobbly once or twice. Um, and it's the most, Rob, it's the most perfect detox. I came out, I hadn't lost that much weight. I'd lost about three and a half kilos, so about, about half a stone. I hadn't lost that much weight, I just changed shape. I'd toned up, I was the fittest I'd been since I was in my twenties, both physically and mentally. Um, and so I'd do it again. And I think, you know, maybe at some point in all of our lives, having a week or two where we literally just, you know, g g get a retreat or whatever it is, it's done me a lot of good. Mm. Wow. A lot of good. Now, I've been on a mission for 17 years to help as many people on this planet get better financial knowledge. If, like me, you'd like to make, manage, and multiply more money, I recommend that you join my digital financial freedom platform. It's really easy to join. You just type in R-O-B dot T-E-A-M. There, you're going to learn my four M's of making, managing, maintaining, and multiplying more money. And the even better news is there's no risk to you because it costs less than 20 pence a day to join. You can cancel any time. Join right now. I'll also give you my 12-week Money Mastermind University completely for free. It exposes the banking system and teaches you how to play them at their own game. If you join Rob.team right now, you get that completely for free. Just type in R-O-B dot T-E-A-M. We'll see you inside with the 10,000 other members in Rob.team. Has being on that show dramatically increased your brand, your reach, and your influence? In terms of brand and reach, with young people, it's unbelievable. You know, just sort of get, you know, go to the local petrol station in Kent, and there's a, you know, two or three teenage girls buying sweets on the way into school, and it's like, ah! <laughs> what have I done? Am I, am I bleeding or something? Um, <laughs> Yeah, amazing, amazing. Uh, but certainly with young people, and you know, and as you know, Rob, I've been working on TikTok and other things like that. It seems to me that public figures in Britain don't even try and reach out to the young. And actually, I see a lot of this Gen Z. You know, we think all youngsters are lazy, useless, want to, want to smoke dope and, and live on benefits. Not, it really isn't true. There's a huge number of these Gen Zers out there who want to work, who want to get on who have the same entrepreneurial ideas that many of you in this room have. Um, and so, yeah, I have found uh, a fantastic feedback from younger people. Um, I got derision, of course, from the media classes and political classes. And now they're writing things like, oh my God, he's so popular after the jungle. What on earth are we gonna do if he goes back into politics? So yeah, it's all been positive feedback. And then, all that really scared me, all that scared me, was kind of having done the deal like a week to go, and I'm thinking, oh my God. I mean, I hate bloody snakes. <laughs> I'm not that brave with spiders, really. And it was, that was the one thing, was to get myself mentally into the place where I could deal with all of that. And my fear was fear of showing fear. You know, you know if you're a soap actress, screaming on TV is okay. If you're Nigel Farage, screaming on TV is not okay. <laughs> I mean, it really isn't okay. <laughs> I thought, God, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to be brave? And, you know, and uh, I'll tell you what I did. I went the week before to see Paul McKenna. The great Paul McKenna, the most famous hypnotist 
and, 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 and you know, psychotherapist, I guess, in the country. And I went to see Paul. He taught me a few basic tricks that you can use if you're in a situation where you've got fear. It's the kind of thing they teach special forces soldiers. You know, if you're going into combat and there's a fair chance of you getting seriously wounded or killed, you know, you've got to be calm, haven't you? You've got to have your wits about you to deal with it. I'm not suggesting being tied eight feet underground to the floor, being covered in 20 snakes, was quite the same as taking on a Taliban, but I've got to tell you, it wasn't a barrel of laughs. <laughs> and all the way through, all the different trials I did, I don't, I don't think I ever showed fear once. I didn't flinch. You could pour cockroaches over me. You could do what you like. I didn't flinch. And, and I learned something, Rob. I suppose if you'd asked me, up until that meeting with Paul McKenna, about the whole mind over matter stuff, I would have sort of said it's a load of cobblers. Having actually done it, I now realize that if we're in control of our minds, we can do anything. We can do anything. Nigel, what needs to change in our political system to improve the economy? Pretty much everything, I would say. <laughs> nothing works, does it? Literally nothing works. From our education system, to our health service, <coughs> to the, uh, the, the lack of choice we face. I mean, look, you know, it, it's really pretty irrelevant whether Sunak or Starmer becomes the next Prime Minister. The differences are marginal. Yes, if you're paying private school fees, Labour might hurt you a bit. Other than that, what's the difference? You know, the Tories put forward a budget, Labour agree with it. They're all big state, they're all social democrat. They so have when, no you mean, when you mean they're all big state, you mean they're controlled by higher global powers? But they have encouraged, and it doesn't matter whether it's Blair or 14 years of Labour, their control over our everyday lives has increased massively. You know, I think I've received more fines in the last year than the previous 40. You know, you're doing 23 on the bloody embankment, you get a fine. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. What about the parking here, folks? How do you get on with that? I said I'd rather pay the fine than go through this agony. So, yeah, the level of state control over our lives, Rob, uh, has gone up. The tax burden is now the highest it's been since 1948. Those that work are increasingly paying for millions who choose not to work, who are happy to take disability benefit, who go on mental incapacity benefit for things that are part of the normal trauma of our lives. Life is never a seamless path. Things go wrong for all of us in our lives. Being human is learning how to deal with those things. We all have short-term depression or short-term downs. But for that, you know, to, to see hundreds of thousands of people since the pandemic put on long-term sickness benefit, which those of you that are working effectively are paying for. So we are overtaxed, we are overcontrolled. There is no understanding of business at all, other than the big businesses that I mentioned earlier. There's virtually nobody on the front benches has ever run their own business. The economy is stagnant. It hasn't grown for two years. But we cheer if, if, if a quarterly figure is up 0.2 of 1%. You go back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, we grew at 2.5% a year. That was what we expected. That went on for decade after decade. We have lumbered ourselves with a model of mass unskilled migration, which has driven productivity down. Now, we're still doing better than our neighbors in Europe. They're doing really badly, but that's cold comfort farm. So what needs to change? I think we need a complete wholesale change of our, I mean, I'm a radical now, I'm a genuine radical. Um, I, I, I really think that our electoral system needs to change. I think that the- I.e. our vote actually counts. Yeah, I think the first past the post thing may well have worked well back in the 1950s and 60s when there were just two parties. That isn't the case anymore. 
There's a much, you know, there's a bigger multiplicity of opinions out there that need some form of reflection in the House of Commons. I think the House of Lords is an abomination, uh, stuffed full of hundreds of Tony Blair and David Cameron's mates, you know, all of whom, all of whom have come through the public sector or big business. Um, and I also think that what the referendum of 16 showed us is that on issues of national importance, if we're not happy with our leaders, we should have the ability to call binding, legally binding referendums on issues that directly affect us. So I'm a radical. I'm a radical. And I... But the whole model, the, the, the Bank of England, the Treasury... I mean, look at the IR35 rules. The IR35 rules are literally insane. Literally insane. You know, really stopping people being self-employed, stopping people being sole traders, forcing many people in their 50s just to throw their hands up in the air and say, I'm going to retire. I'm not going to carry on. And yet, <clears throat> whatever you think of Liz Truss, her book is due out this Tuesday. I've done an hour's pre-record with her, which will go out on the telly tomorrow and Tuesday. That, that's the first TV interview that she's done. Actually, what Truss was trying to do was right. She wanted to keep corporation tax down at 19%, not increase it to 25%. Because obviously there's more money then, Rob, to reinvest for you guys in your own businesses. She, she wanted to completely look at the IR35 rules and scrap them, basically, to encourage as many people as possible to be self-employed or sole traders. A lot of what Trust was trying to do was right. Uh, her problem was she was doing too much too soon. So was, mind, was Liz Trust pushed out by... Liz Trust was pushed, pushed out. The, the Bank of England played a huge role. Uh, the eve of the budget, they sold gilts, government bonds, having spent the previous 12 years buying them. It was a deliberate attempt to spook the markets. The Treasury were against her. The International Monetary Fund were against her. The White House were against her. These, the globalists don't want lower taxes, right? She wanted lower taxes. I want lower taxes. I believe the lower taxes are, the greater the incentive is for all of us to go out and work damned hard and do well. So she was forced out. But unfortunately, I think she bit off more than she could chew. She did too much too soon. Does anybody remember the famous Morecambe and Wise sketch when he's there with Andre Previn? And it's the big dun, 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 dun. And Eric says he's a great concert pianist. And Andre Previn, the most famous conductor of a day, is there. And it's the big build-up. And then Eric's sort of, you know, playing something silly on the piano. And Previn says to Eric Morecambe, you're playing all the wrong notes. No, says Eric Morecambe. I'm playing all the right notes. Just not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> and that's what I think of Liz Truss's budget. <laughs> they were all the right ideas, but it just wasn't done the right way. So to get entrepreneurship to be encouraged in this country, we will need to break the Treasury model. There will need to be a war against the Bank of England, a war against the, the increasingly bureaucratic state that actually has more power over our lives than elected politicians do. This is all a result of Blair's Britain, that the judges and the civil servants and the bureaucrats are now the ones that really control our lives. So there needs to be a political revolution, Rob. That is a real answer to your question. But can I just finish by saying this? It's all well and good for me to sit here. And don't forget, I did run my own business for nine years before I got elected to the European Parliament. So I know what it's like to employ people. I know what it's like to have months when my staff earn more than you do. I've been through all of that. I understand all of that. And I'm sitting here telling you that we've got everything wrong. But just because government doesn't make things easy for you, just because government doesn't encourage you, doesn't mean you can't still succeed. You can still succeed in this country. You can. I just, I just wish it was easier. But you can still succeed. So this is not an absolute council of despair. But my goodness me, we could make it so much better for so many more people. Is there any chance at any point, sometime in the next few years, 
we could sneak an entrepreneur in a place of political power and influence. Yeah, I mean, Mrs. Thatcher had a guy called Lord Young of Grafham, and she said he was her, he was her favourite cabinet minister because he never brought her problems, he always brought her solutions. And Grafham was an entrepreneur, Grafham was an angel investor, uh, you know, Grafham backed all sorts um, of, uh, Young backed all sorts of small businesses. Uh, yeah, we haven't had, Gordon Brown teased with it a little bit, um, but never really stuck the course. Look, you know, one thing Trump did in his first term, he got people in senior positions in government who'd never been in politics before, but had been massively successful businessmen and businesswomen who'd built corporations, who'd paid lots of tax. Um, and yes, we do need more entrepreneurship in the government. And frankly, I mean, look at the front benches, if you can bear to. I mean, talk about the bland leading the bland, bloody hell. There's almost no one there that's ever run a small business. So yes, that voice is vital. And you know, if you take the private sector, you know, small and medium-sized enterprises still provide over 60% of all the jobs in the private sector. You know, it still is an absolutely vital linchpin, indeed backbone, of the British economy. Um, and it needs a bigger voice, a stronger voice, it needs some encouragement. And, you know, arguably, the 1980s were that period. Those of you in the room old enough to remember, you know, in the 1980s, going out on your own, setting up your own business, being ambitious, wanting to make money, those things became fashionable. And that was because top rate tax, income tax, went from 83% in the pound to 40p in the pound. And now what's happening is we're going the other way. That 40p rate that was the top rate of tax, even during Tony Blair's premiership, right? Remember that? 40p was the top rate of tax under Blair. One and a half million people paid 40p. By 2027, 8 million will pay 40p or more. That gives you some idea of the extent to which everybody is being taxed more than they ever have been before. And some of the cliff edges are extraordinary. Some of the cliff edges, you know, if you earn over 100,000, suddenly your marginal tax rate is 62%. And one of my worries, Rob, is for the first time since the late 1970s, there is a brain drain going on. We're losing bright, young entrepreneurs. They're going well, a lot to Australia, but many to Lisbon. Lisbon cutting five-year tax deals, etc. cetera, or they were. Uh, Milan in northern Italy are doing the same. And we're losing people. Because kind of no one works on Mondays or Fridays anyway. You can be in Lisbon. You can fly into London or Manchester to have your meetings. Um, and if we, don't, if we don't correct this, this brain drain will continue and we'll start to lose our brightest and best from our country, and we can ill afford to do that. So we have to fight this narrative that those that make lots of money must pay more tax, right? In 2010, when the Tories came to power, the top 1% of taxpayers paid 20% of tax receipts, right? That top 1% are now paying 30% of our total tax receipts. If you say to rich, successful people, we're going to punish you, guess what they do? They bugger off. <laughs> and that's a disaster for all the rest of us. So a lot of these narratives need to be fought. In short, what I'm saying, Rob, is this. The cultural change we need is this. We need to be championing and telling young people success is good. Profit is good. Doing well is good. It's nothing, nothing to be ashamed of. We should encourage entrepreneurship, wealth, and success. Let's make those good things, not bad things. I really believe in that. So you have this mate in America. Yeah. <laughs> What's he really like? Oh, terrific. Mm. Terrific. He's uh, sorry. We have someone with Tourette's in the room. She's, <laughs> she's right. been at it all week. <laughs> he's uh, he's. What's he really like? He he is a New Yorker of a certain age and a certain background, and of, you know 
Is he a bit out there in terms of what he says? Of course he is. New Yorkers are. Rather like judging Fren uh, the, the French by Parisians. Parisians are much more brutal and sharper and perhaps ruder than the rest of people in France. New Yorkers infamously, infamously say what they think. He's, I tell you what I have seen, he is so good with people. Amazing. Generally, senior politicians hate meeting the public. They can't bear it. They can't bear it. It's like an ordeal they have to go through. And I've watched him, and there might be a lineup, say 50, 100 people have paid a couple of thousand dollars, five thousand dollars to have a photograph with him. You know, and that's like going to be 40 minutes of his time, just photograph after photograph after photograph. <clears throat> and as a presidential candidate, he's expected to do that day after day after day all over America. And it's pretty wearing, pretty tiring stuff. And yet I've watched him do it. You know, middle-aged couple have come up. He look at the woman. He said to the guy, my God, you're the lucky guy. She's amazing. I mean, how good do those people feel? How good do those people feel? I was sitting in a restaurant. I was sitting in Trump Hotel, Washington one night. The waitress, I don't know, 21, 22, and as she served him his steak, she said, oh, I enjoyed your speech this morning. And there'd been a conservative conference taking place just down the road that morning. He said, what, you were there? She said, yes. He called the manager. She's off duty, pull up a chair. And this 21-year-old waitress suddenly is sitting next to the President of the United States, who then ignores me. <laughs> <laughs> bit younger than you, Nigel. And, 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 well, a bit fitter than me, absolutely. <laughs> um, and she gets 20 minutes of his undivided attention. There's no benefit to Trump in doing that whatsoever. It's not going to appear in a newspaper or on a TV programme. He is brilliant with people. He's got enormous charm. He's the sort of guy that walks onto the building site and speaks to all the lads. Um, I, listen, I like him a lot. He's also incredibly funny to be with. You know, one-on-one -on -one when you're with him, he's incredibly funny. A couple of occasions where I've thought, God, I just hope the next table didn't hear what he just said. <laughs> <laughs> but his instincts, Rob, on the big stuff are right. His instincts on China were right. He's the guy that woke us up to the threat that China poses. Or should I say, China. <laughs> <laughs> He always does it, doesn't he? It's always China. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, he was right about that. He was right about Iran. Look at what Iran's done overnight. Who funded all of that? That moron, Obama and Biden and the European Union and the British Foreign Office, all thought they could appease Iran by freeing them up with this nuclear deal, freeing up tens of billions of dollars, which they've used to fund Hezbollah, they've used to fund Hamas, they've used to fund the Houthi rebels, and they're now firing rockets directly into Israel. Trump was right about that. I think he's right. The little detail stuff, and some of the messages he puts out on social media, but the big stuff he's right about. And do you know what? Do you know what? I went over the top to support him in 2016. I've never withdrawn, I've never wavered, I've built a good friendship with the man, I admire him hugely, and I genuinely believe when he's back in the White House, the world will be a safer place than it is today. <laughs> is Donald Trump a smart entrepreneur? Well, he's absolutely, I mean, everything about Trump is entrepreneurship, isn't it? Everything about Trump is, let's have a go. Let's have a go. Some things will succeed, some things will fail. You know, his whole career is, is a history of massive successes, disastrous downs. It looks like the current one, the launch, the launch of Truth Social on NASDAQ, seems to have netted him quite a lot of money, uh, which should help quite a lot. Yeah, he is absolutely, um, he is absolutely about supply-side reform. Don't forget, he, you know, he slashed corporation tax in America, which, which, which had actually been the highest in the Western world. He is all about entrepreneurship. He's all about business. And you know, there's an old lesson in this, that, that unless you create wealth, you can't have hospitals. You can't have schools. 
You have to create wealth. And Trump understands that. I'm not, I'm not, not actually sure that the current Labour and Conservative parties get it because they just increase the deficit or they, they, they borrow every year far more money, you know, we're spending way more than we're earning every single year. And you think about it this way. You know, when the Conservatives came to power, the accumulated national debt since Napoleonic times was about eight to 850 billion. It's now 2.7 trillion. Now, yes, there's a bit of inflation during that period. And the same is happening in America, where a trillion dollars is being added to the national debt every three months. Wow. They're up to about 35 trillion. And you, and you ask yourself, why is gold going up? Because I think people can sense that what happened in 2008 is going to happen again. I can't tell you when, but at some point, there's going to be another big credit squeeze and bust. It has to happen. You can't go on forever living on the never, never. Um, and Trump, you could criticize him for saying he wasn't that great with the deficit either. But I think in terms of wealth creation, you know, it's amazing. Georgia, take the state of Georgia. A combination of not just Trump, but a local governor, Nathan Deal, pro-business, pro-low taxes, pro-enterprise zones. The Georgian economy grew at 4.4% for three consecutive years. We can't even dream of that, can we? In fact, on the current lot, <coughs> I doubt we'll grow 4% in the next 10 years, let alone every year. So it goes to show government doesn't create wealth, but government can create the conditions in which human beings are more likely to take risks, work hard, be entrepreneurial, and make money. Government doesn't make wealth. Government consumes wealth. Government damages wealth. You make wealth. And government needs to make it easier for all of you. Because if they do that, the life, life will be better for all of us. So, Nigel, you kindly invited me to your 60th birthday. I know, 60. <laughs> I think you'd had a few. I should hope so. <laughs> and you did a speech and you yeah. teased everyone because you suggested that maybe you could do something in America yep. or maybe you could lean more into politics or maybe you could do more of the, <coughs> the news and media. Can you give us a bit of a scoop on the next move for Nigel Farage? Well, I could do. I'm not going to, but I could do. <laughs> um, no, I mean, look, Rob, there's been endless speculation in the media. It goes on month after month after month. What's Farage going to do? Is he going to re-enter the front lines of politics? And it's not exactly top of my bucket list, because I did that for a very, very long time, and it's a very, very tough, unpleasant, poorly paid place to be. But, you know, I'm beginning to think that maybe even under our system, I'm beginning to think maybe a really big historic opportunity is opening up. Maybe e. for you to be prime minister. Well, that wouldn't, I mean, that, 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 that's not a one-step process. Obviously. No, of course. That would take longer. But, but, you know, maybe, maybe this election is worth fighting. Maybe I can help promote a real big kind of earthquake-type breakthrough. Rob, I, I don't know yet. I'm not going to do it for the sake of it. I'm not going to do it to get millions of votes and fewer than a handful of seats, because I've done that before. And that is like banging your head against the brick wall. It's blooming depressing. But if I think there is a chance of really busting this thing in a dramatic way that would build up to perhaps a new political force winning in 2029, because Labour are not going to have a honeymoon. Labour are not going to be, a, you know, Labour will struggle in government. I don't see the competence on that front bench. I really, really don't. However much I love Angela Rayner, I just don't see that competence. Um, that joke didn't work, did it? Never mind. Um, the, um, talk about charmless, God help us. <laughs> the, so, Rob, I've got to make my mind up. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky, so I've just turned 60, uh, a lot of my schoolmates are retired, or, you know, I've, I've got no intention of retiring ever, 
ever. You know, why should I? I mean, my, um, my father worked as a stockbroker to his 75th birthday, and he was dined out last year, aged 87, as president of his regiment. So he retired at 87. I have no intention of stopping. I've got loads more things I want to do. I think work is good for us. Work is good for us. Another thing, we must start teaching kids. Actually, work gives us a sense of who we are as people. You know, it matters. It, gives, it also gives us a discipline. Um, and yes, playing hard is important too. So, Rob, I don't know. I'm very lucky. Um, things at GB News are Give going... Give us something. GB News, GB News is going very, very well. <laughs> My friend's about to become the 47th president of America. Ooh. And I may do politics again. I may not. I haven't. And the honest answer is, I haven't yet made up my mind. <clears throat> but let me ask you guys. You know, how many of you seriously would be prepared to consider voting for a different party to the one you voted for last time round? Yeah, it's very interesting. It's very in You see, the, something's happening out there. Yeah. I sense something's happening out there. And by this, do you mean is there a chance of some new party coming in, or is that just too impossible? <coughs> well, you know, obviously, I'm not going to join the Labour Party, am I? That's not going to happen in a hurry. You know, the sort of... My, my, my Corbynista side is underdeveloped, let's put it like that. Um, the current Conservatives, I wouldn't know what they stand for. So if I was to do it again, it would be through reform. Yeah. But, it, but it is effectively a new party. Mm. It's, a continuum of the, it's a continuum of the Brexit party, but it is, it is a new party. It's, you know, it's a very big ask. Mm. It's a very, very big ask. Um, I haven't decided. I guess I've got a few more weeks. I've got a few more weeks to decide but no more than that. I can promise you, my family would much rather I never touched politics again. <laughs> Will that influence my decision? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nigel, so <coughs> uh, a slightly more quick fire round yeah, now okay. to Here goes. finish up. Here goes. Um, What's the best advice you ever remember receiving? The best advice I got was from my headmaster the day I left school. He said, you're a terrible disappointment to us, Farage. We, 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 we hoped you'd go off to Oxford or do, you know, do something sensible, but you're heading off to the city. He said, remember, when you work in the city, to make sure that your shoes are clean, your hair's cut, your nails, your, your na nails are cut, and you call everyone sir, and so we tell you to stop being so bloody stupid. <laughs> And those basic rules, you know, when you, f it's a cliche, but never getting a second chance to make a first appearance. If you're out meeting customers or potential customers, being on time, being well turned out and being polite, being polite is the most important of all of them. It goes a hell of a long way. It was great advice, mm -hmm. great advice. And what's... <laughs> And what's the worst advice you ever remember receiving? Oh, well, I can't. I mean, honestly, you know, the worst advice, I'll tell you the worst advice. I'm a great believer. It's not always right, but I'm a great believer in first instincts about people. You meet someone, nah, I don't trust him. And then someone working in the same company as you or the same political parties has said, Nigel, come on, yeah, okay. He's not really your sort. I get that. You know, he's a bit shy, whatever. But, you know, come on, give him a break. And you say, oh, all right, OK, all right, OK. We'll, we'll give him a go. The number of times I've been talked out of my initial gut instinct of what a deal, a good deal, was a person the right person. And I've been talked out of it. And nearly every time, my first instinct was right. Trust your instincts in life. Trust your instincts about people, businesses, partners, whatever it is. Don't listen to anybody else. Trust your own judgment. And, and in the end, that, if you think about it, that's what being an entrepreneur is, isn't it? Because when you're an entrepreneur, the successes and failures are all on you. You can't blame anybody else. So don't seek too much counsel from other people. Trust your own judgment. Believe in yourselves.
Nigel, what's your most brutal life lesson? Most brutal life lesson? Oh, gosh, I've had so many. Um, uh, don't get into a light aircraft towing a banner. It can end very badly. <laughs> uh, don't try and cross a main road after nine pints of Guinness. That's <laughs> another one. Um, to be honest, Rob, I've had so many knocks. You know, physical. I mean, I joked about the plane crash. I was run over by a car. I've been through cancer. I've had, you know, financially some good times and some terrible times. I feel I've had more highs and lows in my life than most people age 60. Um, so I kind of... The answer to your question is, it depends how your brain works. I think over 60 years, all the huge experiences I've had, good and bad, when I wake up in the morning, what are the things I remember? The bad things or the good things? The good things. The bad things I put to the back of my mind, I forget, I hardly ever even think about. And I think if you allow brutal lessons in life to upset your, to upset your equilibrium, you'll never be the same person again. I think we all have to have within us an innate sense of optimism. And I think if we allow the bad stuff to dominate us, uh, we'll never ever succeed and we'll never ever be happy. And I am actually very happy. I'm very happy. I just remember good stuff. What one main thing do you think is wrong in the world that you would love to change? Oh, well, of course, on the big picture, it's the number of tyrants all around the world, oppressing people, killing people, imprisoning people, and maybe taking us closer to the brink of a, of a, of a global war than we've been since 1945. On, you know, on, a, on a big picture, that's terrifying. And, you know, communism, repression, uh, the direction that China's going in, and you can ally that to fundamental extremist Islam in, in the shape of Iran, um, and, that, and that's very, very scary. And I think, you know, with all its imperfections, living in a democratic nation state is a damn sight better than any other form of life that mankind, in its two million years of evolution, has yet come up with. So I think fostering a fundamental sense of, of the nation state being what we belong to, but us being the masters, not a dictator or a president or a Blair type figure. Um, you, know, you know, us being the masters of it, that, that's the world that I want to live in. That's the safest world. The funny thing is also, democracies are also the richest countries. I might bemoan our growth figures. I might bemoan our productivity figures, but you're all better off than those living in North Korea, aren't you? You know, you, you're better off than 99% of people living in China. Actually, you know, give human beings freedom, it's amazing what they can achieve. It's amazing, you know, how they can prosper. So, so yeah, yeah pushing, pushing freedom and democracy, I think, has to be the clue, the absolute key mm. uh, to a good future for the world. But I'm afraid, Rob, we're a long way from it right now. Mm. Sad to say. Nigel, what's a secret you've never shared or a story you've never told? <laughs> Lock the doors! Well, <laughs> Turn off the cameras! <laughs> well, I can assure you there are plenty of those. Um, there are plenty of those. No, actually, well, we all commit, I mean, we all commit personal stupidities through our life. We just hope that when you finally grow up, these things stop, and, and now that I've hit 60, I'm confident that, you know, <laughs> in future we'll be okay. Um, there's, there, there, there is no big secret, but I'm often asked, I'm often, particularly by young people, you know, I might get a group of 20 kids online, want to do five minutes online for a chat, and people say, what's the secret to success? Well, you know, success is, is all a fairly subjective term. Anyway, I just, the, the one thing I think that I've learned above all is nearly everyone I know that succeeded, whether it's in sport, whether it's in business, whether it's in politics, nearly all the people I know that have really reached the top and stayed at the top. Because, you know, greatness is about staying at the top. Reaching the top is one thing, staying there's another. And the one thing I've learned, the one big secret and the thing that I've employed is nearly, in nearly every single case, those that succeed 
work harder in a more dedicated, disciplined fashion than everybody else they were up against. There is no substitute in life for sheer, honest, hard work. And that may be a message that people don't want to hear. Because they want to think, no, no there, is, there is a piece of magic I can grab. But actually, good, solid, hard work. Dedication and, and, having a, you know, and looking at a goal. You have to see a vision. You must see a vision. You know, you, I mean, that's what ambition is about. You've got to see where you want to go. And if you have a dream in life, follow that dream. I had a dream, Rob. I must have been mad. You know, I was 29, 30 years old. I just set up my own business in the city. I had two young kids, a golf handicap of four. You know, I had a lot to live for. And yet, I thought, I just believe that I'm the person that can bring this message, that what we're building in Brussels is a globalist structure that's bad for us in democratic terms and economic terms, and I'm gonna pursue it. And probably, there was a 99% chance of failure. As it happened, it worked. If I'd known it was gonna take 27 years, I might have thought twice, but it worked. But even if it hadn't worked, I followed my dream. And I said that to every young person, work hard, if you have a dream, follow it. What could be worse than being towards the end of your life thinking, I had a chance to do something and I didn't give it a go? Give things a go. You know, success is success, failure is failure, this is all part of life. I think the biggest regrets people have in later life are not things they've done, they're things they haven't done. So if you see opportunities, grab them with both hands, go for it. Final question, ah, Nigel. Here we go. <laughs> We're at the Moneymaker Summit live. Yeah. And I usually ask my guests when I'm on the show, what does the word disruptive mean to you? But we're at a live event. So let's have a money question. Does money make you happy? Uh, not having money makes you very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> which, no, which is the right answer. Really? If you don't, I mean, I, I have to be honest, there were, there were a few years there where I really struggled very badly, very, very badly. Uh, the financial sacrifice I made to do politics was enormous. You know, lots of my friends that you met at my birthday, a lot of them are very, very I, mean, I mean, a lot of them are on the rich list. I gave up a lot to do it, and I did struggle for a bit with, you know, big family, etc. Uh, worrying about money is horrible. Money buys you freedom. Money gives you choices. Money of itself cannot make you happy. And in fact, too much money brings the nightmare problems of inheritance and who can you trust to be friends or not. But you know what? Given the choice, <laughs> I'd rather have the money than not have the money. <laughs> Please, everyone, would you stand up and give Mr. Nigel Farage a huge round of applause? <laughs> Duncan. Yes. One more time for Nigel.